Uh, good evening and welcome to the Future Security Initiative Spring Speaker Series. Um, for those who are not familiar, the Future Security Initiative is a partnership between Arizona State University and New America, a DC-based think tank. Uh, I co-direct this with my colleague, Peter Bergen. Um, and we run a fall and spring speaker series and we're thrilled to have uh, uh, Victor Blue with us today. Um, uh, Victor is a 2023-2024 ASU Future Security Fellow at New America. And that means that he's one of this year's class of New America Fellows, uh, supported by Future Security Initiative, which is a group of around 15 to 20 individuals, writers, photographers, filmmakers, and others, um, real thought leaders in the field who are selected out of an applicant pool of about 300, 350, depending on the year. And so we're really honored to have Victor with us tonight. Um, he is a photojournalist and a writer who's working on the legacy of armed conflict and the unequal outcomes driven by policy and politics. His current documentary projects focus on Afghanistan, which is what he'll be talking about this evening, and Guatemala, and his photographs appear regularly in the New York Times, the New Yorker, Harper's Magazine, the New York Times Magazine, Bloomberg News, uh, and the Wall Street Journal. His work has been supported by grants from the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting, the National Press Photographers Association, and the Ohio University. His works are in seven pictures of the year international awards, five NPPA Best Photojournalism Awards, and recognition from the Overseas Press Club. He's currently preparing a book on the conflict in Afghanistan that traces the arc of the war from the counterinsurgency surge in 2009 through the dramatic Taliban takeover in 2021. And his presentation this evening is called Swift Justice, a Taliban courtroom in session. And we're really fortunate to be able to see firsthand some clips from um, a, a Taliban courtroom, like the title suggests. And so thank you all for joining us this evening. And Victor, thank you so much. We'll hear a presentation from Victor and then we'll have a chance for some Q&A. Thanks, I appreciate it, Daniel. I appreciate uh, you guys having me tonight. Um, I'm excited to share some work with you all and talk about Afghanistan and um, Sharia and the Taliban and kind of what it all means uh, moving forward and what it all means as we look back in the rearview mirror. Um, so I'm going to share some pictures here. All right. So uh, as Daniel said, my name is Victor. I'm a photojournalist. I'm based here in New York City. Uh, I've, been working, I've been a working photographer for about 20 years now, and I've been working in Afghanistan since 2009. Um, I first went to Afghanistan that year to photograph the counterinsurgency uh, surge of troops into the country under President Obama's renewed strategy. Counterinsurgency uh, doctrine, strategy, better known as COIN, was the kind of set of ideas that military leaders uh, embraced to win the war in Afghanistan. The idea was to clear, hold, and build. Um, they embraced full spectrum operations. The people are the prize. Focus on the population, their needs, and security. Um, the more force used, the less effective it is. These were the ideas that were supposed to turn the tide of the war in Afghanistan. I was interested in Afghanistan because I'd seen what counterinsurgency meant in other contexts. Um, I, I specifically, I spent years photographing the aftermath of the war in Guatemala, where these ideas were kind of uh, put 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 into practice to 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 brutal consequences. And I and I knew that I wanted to make a visual record of the gap between what our political and military leaders said and what they were going to do was what they said they were going to do and the expression of those ideas on the ground. So over the next 11 years, I, I, I created this detailed visual record um, of what coin strategy looked like uh, from the ground up, not from the top down. Um, I read and I digested this doctrine and I let it guide me as I tried to manifest itself and it manifest its tenets in images. I spent my time in Afghanistan photographing the atomization of US forces that inserted them into the daily lives of Afghan villagers. And I worked in the places where both combat and culture intersected between them. 
I work to interpret the spaces between the assumptions of our military leaders and the expression of those prerogatives by the young soldiers and Marines who are tasked with implementing them in the fields and hamlets of Afghanistan. What I found in the end was an uneven application of ideas that that it sounded compelling in theory, but got very, very complicated, kind of where the rubber hit the road. And in 2014, US troops began to evacuate the country, began their pullout and handed and, and began to hand the war over to Afghan forces. So everything changed on August 15th, 2021, as I stood on the street and photographed some of the first Taliban units to enter Kabul as the 20 year Western project in Afghanistan collapsed in a matter of hours. At the time, it felt as if the scales were falling from my eyes. I mean, so like for 11 years, these guys had been ghosts to us, to Western journalists. You know, some folks had been able to manage contact or access to Taliban forces still operating in the field, but it was always extremely, extremely limited. And for those of us who had kind of spent time in, in the field with U.S. forces, the Taliban were always kind of a shadowy kind of, you know, ghost-like entity out there somewhere. But all of a sudden now they were here and we could talk to them and, you know, they had won the war. So myself and a, and a kind of small coterie of journalists, we stayed behind um, as the Western uh, project, the Western press and diplomatic corps evacuated the country. Um, as the Talibs consolidated their rule, I spent over, I traveled through the countryside and places that were never accessible before. And as I did that, I had my assumptions about Afghanistan and the war there, and especially Islam uh, challenged. I documented this new reality as well as its consequences for women and girls as the Talibs continued to erase them from public life. And I was forced to kind of reckon with um, the things that so many of us, the, the, the reality that so many of us in journalism saw the war through a distorted lens, uh, one that in the end kind of flattened Afghanistan instead of kind of resolving it in all of its complexity. So in early 2022, I was back in New York City and I was talking with my friend Ross McDonald and I was telling him about, um, you know, Ross had worked in Afghanistan in previous years and we were talking about the fall and I told him about some of the stories that I wasn't able to complete in the, you know, in the four and a half months I had spent there um, just before and, and during and after the fall. And um, as I, I, I when I, as I was going through them, I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the Sharia courts were operating. Um, and I had a friend, a journalist, Nana Mustafinson, uh, a, a Danish journalist who had um, been to southern Afghanistan and, and, and visited one of these courts. And as I described it, he kind of stopped me and said, you know, that sounds like a film to me. Um, I'd been only thinking of doing the story as a kind of uh, photo essay. So we started to collaborate and you know, that was like in January and by May, we were on our way to Musakala in southern in Helmand province in the south of the country, which is kind of like the heartland of Taliban controlled Afghanistan. Um, and so we got down there and with the help of the, the New Yorker and the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting, we were able to uh, embed ourselves in a Sharia court in, in the district of Musakala and, and shoot a documentary about how this court was functioning. Um, so I'm going to show a couple of clips um, real quick, uh, about three minutes long, and, and I'll, I'll kind of let you know what's going on with each one. This is the intro to our film. You can see it on newyorker.com. It's um, also, you can watch it on YouTube. It's it's actually, I think, well over a million views at this point on YouTube. And it's, I believe, from what they tell me at the New Yorker, the second most viewed uh, documentary that, that they've ever published at the New Yorker. So. Um, Here's the intro to the film.
Da, furore și reati. Pășirati de ce am rat nestea. Ai văzut că 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 ai Ai să fac ta aici n-ap care da, nu te gândești să fac. Că de vreți să fac aici n-ap care nu. Ma cum să fac? Ma cum să fac? Ma cum să fac? Ma cum să fac? ده حد so that's kind of a setup to the film, an introduction to the courtroom, the courts, um, the main judge, Abdul Sattar, the main Taliban judge. Um, you know, I kind of I can sort of conceive of the film as kind of a um, a Judge Judy uh, meets Southern Afghanistan style sort of thing. Um, you know, I, I had a pretty good idea that the disputes that we would see would be kind of small potatoes disputes, kind of land, inheritance, small claims, court type uh, type cases. Um, the idea for us is that we would kind of embed in the court and have and hopefully outline the ways that the Taliban handle these problems and see what it looked like for them to implement Sharia law um, to the to to the people of Musakala, the people of of, of Helmand province. But what we didn't kind of anticipate is that we would get a sort of amazing window into the tensions between conservative Afghan society and the tenets of Sharia law, the kind of, you know, Quranic um, kind of rules that it, that it kind of outlines. So I'll play a clip now. The second clip I'm going to play here is kind of like the main case that 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 the film our film the film's a short film it's only 14 minutes long but um i've edited down for the purpose of our of our discussion tonight uh, 
شریعت دباندی حق چری که غربیات شوا چه ده حق کتی ورکر سی آغاز مرد که شریعت کم نسته ما در کلم داغ شایدان دی شایدان از خلق محکمه پساسی برای این وقتا چی گور امانه دا پا ما کرده برای وچ پا وایدی کلو برای این چالش شخص شیفتا دا دا نما تفیست دی اپنا ویست دا اما بست دا Tapi pada waktu mahu pasti kau pasti baru sebab mahu jadi rasanya. Sebab boleh nak ajar nama apa yang rasanya dari hilal zaman itu. Jadi kalau yang baru itu boleh ajar itu. شریعت کی زمرد ملک زنانی در افغانستان در مسلمانان و زنانی اغا پا دی بانی معمور دی چه دوی بانو خبل در خاون خبل در زوج اطاعت کوی شاید افشوی تیبت پس در امر نکی دس خلاف امر تیبت بانی بینی جوان وس پشیریات کی داشیریات داشی کردی چه ارچاتی داخل آور کرده ده شاید سعی خبر آورده داری تا دو بات نکیا کاستا مرسلی میشی داشتی یه دیشب یه دیکی فردا یه پاتر نیز دیس زدارس وایم چه دیگه شد و جرایس مرسلی داشتی استان سر مارگان داری Estava andando. Não, quando saí eu me arrei muito. Mas lá, eu me arrei muito, mas lá, da Deusão que eu vou, da Deusão não é nada que eu vou dar. Mas não está tendo segurança? Não está tendo segurança, mas eu estou aqui, eu estou aqui, eu estou aqui, eu estou aqui, eu estou aqui. Então, eu estou aqui, eu estou aqui, eu estou aqui. Eu estou aqui, eu estou aqui, eu estou aqui. Eu estou aqui, eu estou aqui. دانی که خون داد خود تلا نظام دی پدربان دگانی کی دانی که خون شکار نیست شر بیبی شپیات سه وای نرست پوره دی مراست دی ناسی نام نایجوری داده پوره نام نت دفتر تراست و جیت جیت را Okay, so um, over the course of our about a two week, well, 13 day shoot or so, 12 day shoot, um, we saw a total of five cases of women that were uh, brought before the court. Um, two of those women, uh, you know, declined to be filmed. They didn't want to be filmed. And, and we shot uh, three of those cases. And then we kind of landed on uh, Bibi Shafia's case uh, to kind of build the, 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 as the kind of narrative crux of the film. Um, so if you didn't get it from the, from the subtitles, what's going on here is this young woman her name is Bibi Shafia, has come to the court uh, with the help of her father and mother um, to uh, refuse to be married off to her, hus her husband's, her dead husband's brother. Um, in kind of conservative Afghan society, that's a regular, that's a norm, that uh, when a woman's husband dies, she's almost automatically married off to one of his brothers. Um, and so, you know, all of a sudden this case appears before us and we start trying to follow it and trying to understand it and to see exactly, you know, how the Taliban is going to deal with this. Um, you know, Bibi had had refused and she had demanded her rights under Islamic law. And we realized pretty quickly that this is a place where like Pashtun cultural tradition is in direct conflict with Quranic jurisprudence and that we were going to have a chance to watch the judges like wrestle with these two um, with these two poles, these two, these two priorities. So, uh, you know, we, we did, we did that and, and we were kind of surprised at the outcome. So here's the last clip play, um, where we kind of, where we watched the judges kind of deliver their verdict. مطلب استسی مطلب داده چی داشت؟ از دنبال استسی کاری یاست و استسی با کورده کی نکاح وکی؟ نه غیری شری نظر. استسی گور نه. 
ماتوا راس راس ما 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 او د جهالت د هغه عمر څخه چې کوم ده مالی موروس بل سوی دا غز خو اشتنا مو پریس کوي کاش د خپل سر تیله سر ورو جانه خو نو سبا د درازي بارا وای چې هر کوم مرر سره کول نو دې خو مکمې دا را کوم وی ماتوارا سره شرط د شودو د زنانو سره غندي ناغه کې دوی غندي کې بل غندي د دوی د غندلو تل بیا موږ ته بار نه کوو ما Okay, so that's the kind of resolution and the end of the film there. And you, you can see there the, the, the verdict that the Taliban judges came up with. Um, it was, uh, you know, for us, it was, of course, it was surprising. And I think for audiences, it's been surprising. Um, you know, there's a key line in there that the, that the Taliban judge uses, the, the Mufti uses, where he says uh, that <clears throat> the, you know, he calls marrying your brother's widow a pre-islamic dark ages practice right um and that's kind of where you know the the place right there where sharia runs up against the kind of cultural prerogatives uh, of conservative rural afghanistan for us that was a kind of fascinating moment to to to, to witness and then of course all's over bibi shafia you know this woman who comes into the courtroom and is as soon as that she's given any kind of space to express herself, doesn't hesitate. She kind of opens up on these folks, you know, with both barrels called stoners and heroin addicts and liars. And um, it was a it was a fascinating and and a gratifying kind of experience for us to 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 watch to watch and to document. You know, uh, I'll, I'll give before we get into the kind of q and I'll give a real quick kind of postscript here. Uh, my um, partner and uh, my, 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 my producing partner and, and, and filmmaking partner, Ross McDonald, who is a, a brilliant director of photography, director, cinematographer, uh, and a brilliant photojournalist himself. Um, he died tragically uh, back in November, and it's been a real hard thing for for us and his community to grapple with, um, trying to honor his legacy. I'm incredibly proud that this film, Swift Justice, was you know was his last project, uh, last major project, and um, and that it's found uh, such a such a welcoming audience, such a broad audience. 
Um, it's been really gratifying for us, and 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 that's been one of the things that kind of um, has 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 you know helped ease the ease the pain of his loss. Um, so you know, I can I can't say more. You know, I I wrote a piece uh, for the New Yorker, a postscript about Ross, and and you know I, I said in it in that you know during you know two weeks in southern Afghanistan, and we were in Afghanistan for nearly a month together. There were plenty of days. Where I felt like I was going to strangle him, and then when after it was all said and done, I, I don't think I'd ever make a film with anyone else again because he was just such a brilliant, brilliant filmmaker and journalist. So uh, we miss him a lot. Um, it, it, you know, one of, I think one of the things that's kind of that for viewers that really is so surprising is the way that the film kind of puts you right in the middle of the courtroom with the judges and that, and that is a testament to Ross's um, approach, his filmmaking approach. You know, as you can see here, he had no qualms about, you know, jumping into the middle of a scene and, and, and bringing the reader along with him. You're almost kind of riding on his shoulder as he's right in the middle of these uh, fascinating and, and, and pretty intense kind of situations. Um, you know, the judges kind of eventually sort of had a grudging kind of respect for us. Um, you know, uh, they, they, they kind of tolerated our presence in Ross was what just didn't even blink an eye when he would jump in the middle of, of, of these situations um so uh you know our goal with this film for me was to kind of you know i talked about these kind of distorted lenses and our goal with this film was to clarify one of those areas of distortion um justice justice and governance under the taliban you know for years we've been told of um the Taliban shadow judges, right? We all knew about um, the Taliban shadow governors and the shadow rule in areas under their control. Well, now those judges had materialized out of the shadows. They were no longer shadow judges. Now they were the de facto and de jure legal system in the country. Um, and for us, you know, uh, one of the issues for me, as I kind of mentioned before, is in the West, the term Sharia has always been a pejorative. It's been used as a kind of, you know, as a term to kind of scare uh scare folks and to strike fear in us i wanted to see what sharia actually looked like in practice where the actual legal system um you know with this film i wanted to tell a complicated and nuanced story i wanted to tell a story that served as a corrective uh to the to the kind of conventional narrative of the war that the u.s had partnered with a legitimate Afghan political class to shepherd the country toward a modern open future embraced by citizens. You know, the fall of the country to the Taliban uh, kind of pulled the rug out from under that explanation. Um, the end of the U.S. occupation of Afghanistan and the rapid collapse of the government it built kind of represents a milestone in, a, in an ongoing um, centuries long process of Afghan self-determination thwarted by outside intervention over and over again. And the next chapter in Afghanistan has to be written by Afghan people, by the Afghan people themselves. The Taliban, as anathema as they are to many, are best kind of understood as an iteration and not an aberration in that process of self-determination. Um, and with that, uh, Daniel, we can open it up to uh, kind of uh, questions and uh and discussion, if that makes sense for you guys. Absolutely, Victor. Thank you so much. That was it's a it's a great film. Uh, I'm I'm thrilled to hear that a million people have watched it on, at the New Yorker website. Um, so to pick up on your the points you were making, um, how central do you see the Taliban claim that they were standing for? Uh, you know, the 20 years of U.S. presence in Afghanistan, uh, that they were standing on the side of justice, that they were in fact the driving force for social order premised in, in really the rule of law. In fact, when they rose to power, that was also their claim. Um, and how does that resonate now that they actually are the governing body of the country? Well, and it's a great question, you know, um, so a, a weird aspect of the U.S. kind of of the whole 20 years there was that the, the U.S. became the victim of a, a kind of process of politicizing kind of private disputes in Afghanistan, right? It was one of the great mistakes 
that the U.S. and the Western backed government made there. Um, it allowed Afghan power brokers to uh, to use mi U.S. military might to impose their will um, in, 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 in disputes, in business, in, 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 in power struggles. Um, and they could, and, th and then by doing that, they were undermining justice and rule of law and legitimate and their own legitimacy. The Taliban, by providing like a functioning alternative, were able to exploit this weakness and bring order and bring rule of law to places where there, it, it no longer existed because, because of the kind of, it was a bit of a bull in a China shop sort of approach by the U.S. You know, we uh, leaned a lot on and, and, and consulted with um, an amazing uh, academic, Adam Baxco, uh, a, a French uh, academic who's written extensively about the Taliban. And he's written a book about the Taliban courts. And, you know, his his assertion is that by imposing their justice system in rural areas, the Taliban asserted itself as the political authority there. Also, legitimizing their claim to govern the country as it gradually assumed the powers normally vested in a state, right? So um, according to Basco, the Taliban courts are actually what won the war for the Taliban, not not uh, military fight, not military imposition, not fighting, not gaining territory. It was the imposition of the functions of, uh, uh, or the, the, the goal the, of, of a functioning state, you know, the priorities of functioning state that bought people their allegiance and made it impossible to defeat them as an insurgency. For those, oh, here we have a, uh, yeah, for those uh, in the audience, please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A bo box. Um, question here from uh, Valerie Hextra. Beautiful photography. Thank you, Victor. Uh, I am so intrigued about the courts welcoming you in. What was the motive? Uh, was it propaganda? Do, you, do they think that this will mollify Western opinion? Bibi was very brave, but I suspect cameras may have affected her outcome. Uh, thank you for the question. Absolutely. You know, this is a, this is something we get a question we get a lot. Um, and for good reason, people are skeptical about the Talibs, like reasoning for even letting us in. Um, I can tell you that since we shot this film in May of 22, November of that year, and this isn't the only this, this is not the only documentation of a Sharia court. Other Western news outlets have, have had some access. I think this is we spent more time in a Sharia court than anybody else, I think. But um. There were other the Talibs have let other people document this, but in November of 2022, they issued a ban on journalism on Western journalists covering the Sharia courts. I don't know. Our our assumption was because after finally, after more than a year, they were about to start implementing the Hudud and Kis um punishments, you know, the classic eye for an eye kind of punishment we associate with the Taliban. Up to that point, they hadn't been doing so yet. And I, I think honestly. In this time, in this period, like after the fall and kind of for the first year, and to some degree still, the Talibs kind of, they don't see themselves the way we see them, right? They don't see themselves as terrorists. They don't equate themselves with ISIS or Al-Qaeda. They see themselves as a legitimate national political military movement. And because they don't see themselves as doing anything wrong necessarily, they welcomed Western journalists to come and see for ourselves what their movement meant and how it was implementing its rule. Um, and, you know, it did take some jumping through hoops. We had to do some convincing of people to get permissions to, to, to enter. It's not like we just walked up to the Taliban court. It took about a week of, well, it took a few months before that. And then a, a, some amount of time in Afghanistan organizing to, to get permission to get access to the courts. And then as far as, you know, the idea that that they that this was orchestrated for us. I mean, all I can tell you is that, like I said, we saw multiple cases go before the courts. Um, other researchers have also also uh, noticed and remarked on that it, that it seems as though in many areas of southern Afghanistan, women are actually kind of beating a uh, making a beeline for the Taliban courts because this represents their first chance to get any kind of legal recognition of their rights, as opposed to the tribal kind of um, dispute resolution system that's existed in the past where women have zero rights. So for them, Sharia rights are like a major leap forward for these women, right? In the past, when the tribal leaders didn't follow Sharia at all, women had no right of inheritance, no right of self-determination at all. Now the Taliban judges are recognizing certain limited women's rights under Sharia, but actually kind of broad for, for rural Afghanistan, broad uh, rights for women. And so women are like, trying their hardest to get in the court. So like I said, over over the court. So in two weeks, we were there. 
uh, we we were the court meets three days a week, so we we're in court three sessions a week, and then they have like a deliberation day. As I said, we saw five cases. Um, some women, as I said, didn't want to be filmed, and so we we didn't film their cases. Bibi Shafia was brought by her father, um, and you know, I, all I can tell you is the court every morning is a little chaotic, right? They have like a you saw that picture of the scene out front of all everybody waiting to get in the court. They all arrive at the door. They try to get on a list. Um, there's not the, the judges don't know ahead of time like who's coming next. They just ask the court clerk like who's next, and they kind of bring them in. It didn't seem the thing. It didn't seem to me like they really had the wherewithal to sort of kind of prepare like manufacture a case for us. And then of course, we know that it was a legitimate case because after the resolution was of the case, we traveled a couple of hours to the home village of these two families and we interviewed the brothers-in-law got their side of the story we interviewed her father got his background and his history and his side of the story we tried to interview bb shafia kind of on her own and the father her father who appears in the film a little little old white bearded man was like that's a hard no it'll be if we allow you to be to to interview her it'll be a massive stain on our honor so no you can't but you're welcome, but you know, whatever she said in the courtroom, you're welcome to, to use. So cameras on her, of course, to some degree, I mean, you can make kind of the sort of postmodern argument that cameras on anybody changes their behavior for sure. But we work hard as documentarians, as journalists to, uh, to give a, to, to not influence that dynamic at all. I mean, of course, I can tell you that we made this under like the strictest kind of this film is made under the kind of strictest ethical kind of uh, guidelines or strictures. You know, we didn't set anything up. We didn't coach anyone. We didn't tell me to do anything. Everything you see in the film happened before the cameras and Ross and I were scrambling around trying to capture it. So, and I, and I think at the end of the day, I mean, as shocking as it is, um, and we had a couple other stories that were going to be equally kind of as amazing women's stories that didn't, for narrative reasons, kind of pan out in front of the camera. So we, we went with Bibi Shafia's, but I think at the end of the day, we got a really interesting and un, kind of unencumbered window into the advantage of these courts for Southern Afghan women. Could you give us a sense of what it means to present a case before the court? Of how does someone, you, you mentioned that, you know, that Bibi Shafia is coming from a village some distance away. Um, what does it mean for the, how, how does a how does a case get filed? How does a case get heard? Uh, give us sort of a walk us through the process. Right. So, you know, these are uh, these courts, they don't maintain like a kind of court. They, they do have a scribe, but they don't maintain like a bunch of court documents the way ours would in the West. Um, there's no defense lawyers in these courts, at least yet. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure exactly how that's going to play out in the future, um, but at least as of now. So, so you know, you heard the judge mention um, at, during one case, he was like, you each need to bring two witnesses, right? So like these different Quranic sort of um, laws have, have kind of evidentiary rules as well, kind of baked into them. And so, uh, rural folks from southern afghanistan will travel a day or two to the court show up try and get on the docket go before the judges present their case present any documentation or any witnesses they're allowed to, they're able to bring with them the judges will deliberate on the case oftentimes they'll say okay come back you know next week on wednesday or something um when you come back that day we'll have a resolution for you and then the judges like i said they work they hear three days of cases then they have they have off on friday on Saturday, they have a deliberation day where they're sitting at home they're, or they meet up together. They're reading through the Quran and the Hadiths. They're trying to like any like really tough cases. They're trying to, you know, apply these evidentiary rules to and come up with a resolution. So, you know, I, we could tell that some cases kind of went on and on because the judges, may, people would come and maybe not have all their documentation or not have sufficient witnesses. They tell them to come back, try again. But um really the the thing the judges were most proud of is how fast they were resolving disputes right that's important for the taliban they want to resolve disputes very very quickly they want because they understand that the longer the justice goes kind of unserved in the communities you know in the areas in the whole country now but in the areas they control or they're trying to govern the more disruptive it is 
the harder it is for people to kind of they they are very very aware that there's an economic crisis in the country. They're having, they're trying to help people do their best to be able to work, make money, support their families. Like they're not trying to gum up the works. And of course, you know, there's there's no bribery in the Taliban courts, so it doesn't do you any good to kind of drag it out or kind of go like try to go around somebody like that's not going to help your case at all. So yeah, people are coming trying to get on the docket, trying to present their side of the story. The judges are listening to the other side of the story and then giving them a resolution as fast as they can. Does that make sense? And now have have the traditional jurgas uh, that used to resolve disputes in rural communities throughout Afghanistan, have, are they no longer operating and they're now replaced by Taliban Sharia courts? Well, the jurgas are still operating to a degree. The Taliban convened them now, of course, because they need the help, they need the allegiance, and they need the buy-in of tribal leaders. It's just that in many places, and I think the population has stopped bringing disputes to the jurgas, right? Because they get a better result if they bring their result their dispute to the Taliban court. I now, when, and I don't know if sure, but I'm, sorry, I, Victor. When you say better result, this is very interesting. Do you mean that the general rural society, at least where you were, is regardless of the outcomes, sees greater legitimacy in these uh, Sharia courts as opposed to the traditional jurgas that have operated for so long? Absolutely. Absolutely. We interviewed, we did a lot of, something that didn't make the film is we shot a lot of kind of vox pop, you know, sort of like interview people one-on-one -on -one as they came out of court and asked them what they thought. And that was the thing we heard over and over and over again. Out out of the out of your shot of Taliban authorities, out of anybody watching over what we were doing, over and over again, and in court in front of the judges, they would say over and over again that, look, I'll go by whatever the Sharia says. I'll abide by whatever the Sharia says. Whatever, and 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 of course they respect the Talibs as the arbiters of Sharia for them. And so these decisions absolutely hold a kind of legitimacy that the that the old tribal dispute resolution did not. Because if you went before a tribal kind of jurga to have your your there were events, right? And it was all dependent on we're, this is a patronage society. It was all dependent on your um on your proximity to power, how close you were and 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 the kind of political considerations of how a dispute was judged meant a lot for tribal leaders in maintaining their positions of power. But the Talibs, they don't, there's no dog in that fight for them. What matters to them is that they are is their legitimacy. So the kind of you know, the reward is kind of flipped. And so since legitimacy is the most important thing for the Talibs to maintain their their rule, they're, they're th th that's people, you know, they, they have a vested interest in making sure people feel that their case was legitimately decided. Um, so are all of these judges, I assume they're paid by the Taliban, um, are they from the same area where they're where they're operating or are they from different parts of the country? That's super interesting. Um, they get shuffled around a lot. And this is a kind of a, this is a thing the Taliban have been doing since they took, since they took power in 2021 is they move personnel quite regularly because they're concerned with two things. They're concerned with people building up their own individual power bases. The Taliban is an extremely authoritarian organization, right? Every single Talib, has an allegiance to their immediate commander and then the bigger commander and then their, you know, governor of their of their province and then all the way up to uh, Mullah Haibatullah, the Taliban supreme leader. So it's super hierarchical. So, you know, uh, they don't want any single Talib to gain too much power in one area, so they'll kind of shift them around. And so Abdul Sattar, the the head judge in this in this district in Musakala, is actually from Sangin probably about two and a half, three hours away from from uh, from Musakala. And he has to kind of commute every week. And then last year, he was actually moved to Argandab district in Kandahar, which is, you know, a whole different province. It's just outside of Kandahar city. So now as far as of right now, last I heard, which is not too long ago, is he's currently a district judge just outside of Kandahar city. So they're moving these guys around quite a bit so that they're not, so that they can maintain their, you know, uh, so they, they you know they can so they don't get too compromised and they can make, make, so they don't, you know so they don't get too uh so they don't get corrupt 
Uh, two related questions here um, uh, from Susan Widener and then from another question from Valerie Hextra. Um, before the Taliban took over, there were women judges, legislators, and government ministers. Do you did you observe or hear of any women being involved in the administration of justice in the Taliban? No, at this point, I, I, I've, I've heard of no women being involved. And I would imagine that there are no women being involved in the administration of justice or in the, in the kind of justice system in Afghanistan. I mean, look, for sure, there's no question that Taliban rule has been a disaster for urban and Afghan women, for Afghan women in any of the kind of big cities, um, and especially for professional Afghan women. There's, it's, they've been erased from public life. The Taliban don't allow them to work, don't allow them to hold positions of, of, of power or influence. Um, they've completely marginalized them. It's a little bit different in certain sectors in health and education. Um, you know, and in those sectors, women are kind of quietly allowed to work in the ministries in certain areas, but um, there's no question that they've been totally pushed out. You know, the, when you're talking about these, these these female judges, lawyers, prosecutors, um, those are folks who, of course, worked super hard um, under the rubric of the kind of Western project in Afghanistan. They studied law, they were they were accomplished, they were professionalized, and they and they assumed positions of influence in that system. But and and Dan, you know a lot about this because of your involvement in it. But you know that was a, that I used was to a run legal programs system training was, those women judges. <laughs> exactly, that was a program that you know the West brought in um, okay. after the after 9-11, after the fall of the first Taliban regime, and so that's uh, that was a system that saw that at after twenty years, and the numerous problems that developed over those twenty years had very little legitimacy in the country. You know. Um, there was very little dispute resolution actually happening and there was very little happening for everyday Afghan folks in order to kind of live their day-to-day -day lives. So it's an absolute tragedy that these women um, have been sidelined. And I'll tell you, as a quick side note, they're actually, and I've tried to do a story about this and was unsuccessful, but I'm, I hope to be able to do it. There's actually a strain of Afghan women professionals, ultra conservative, ultra religious Afghan women who have, who at least right after the fall in 2021, were beginning to organize themselves to petition and pressure the Taliban to allow them to, to, to assume positions of, of influence and to study under the new, under the new regime, but not coming from a kind of Western feminist sort of uh, perspective, but coming from a, from an ultra conservative um, Islamist perspective, because again, and one, you know, I talked about this tension between Afghan society and Quranic sort of dictates. Like it's, you know, the Taliban are having a hard time justifying their exclusion of women from education and from professional work because those two tenets are very clearly defined in the Quran. But again, this is a massive fight within in the Taliban. It's been a massive source of tension within the movement. Um, it's not a uh, kind of monolithic movement. There's a wide variety of opinion about how this should happen going forward. And I have a suspicion that some of these ultra conservative, ultra Islamist uh, women's groups are going to be the ones to eventually kind of crack open education and, and public service for women in Afghanistan. Are, are, do you find when your, your uh, conversations with people on the street, you get away from Taliban judges, Taliban officials. Did people talk much about corruption, whether corruption was an issue, you know, previously, whether corruption is an issue now? How much is that part of the debate and discussion about the legitimacy of the current state? Uh, it's a huge, it's a huge discussion. Um, I think, uh, and it kind of depends on where you're talking. It kind of depends on, you know, Afghanistan is, 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 is different than our society in, in, a, in a million ways. But one of the main ways is that it's a, basically a rural society. You know, 60% of Afghans live in, uh, in, in a rural setting. They don't live in cities, unlike in our country, right? The majority of our population live in cities. And so the culture, the priorities, the kind of worldview is really distinct between urban Afghans and rural Afghans. And the Taliban clearly represent a kind of rural constituency. And one of their big problems, one of the things they have the most trouble doing is imposing this kind of rural worldview 
on what on these massive kind of metropolises that grew up over the last 20 years, Kabul, Harat, Mazar Sharif, to some degree, Kandahar, even though Kandahar is quite conservative. So in that way, people have different perspectives on this issue if they're in the cities or in rural areas. Um, but I would say everyday Afghans are like extremely, extremely kind of vigilant about corruption and very vigilant about Taliban corruption. And you are starting to hear things here and there about Taliban corruption. So far, mostly it's kind of like not your kind of quid pro quo retail corruption. It's the Talibs trying to control like resources, right? Trying to control contracts, control access to things, trying to control who benefits from what, you know? Um, so you do hear about it. Afghans talk about it all the time. I haven't heard, and, you, and you're, you're starting to hear like kind of little, kind of small kind of whispers about things that somebody's heard or somebody's seen. But so far it hasn't been anything like what like the wholesale theft uh, that, the, that the previous government engaged in and that was countenanced by the Western governments that backed them, right? The Kabul Bank kind of disaster and all this. Nothing like that's happening, partly because also the economy has cratered, you know, the economy is in really bad shape. Talibs have done an amazing job stabilizing the currency. When I was there last time, the the Af the Afghani was the it was the most expensive it had been in years since I've been in Afghanistan. Like it's gained a lot of strength in the in the last year. Um, but that said, you know, Afghans are very vigilant about corruption. They're watching it, and you know, this is for me is going to be the great test of Taliban um, governance. Is are they able to hold on to this? That's the one thing that separates them. That's the one thing that buys them legitimacy with the population is their incorruptibility. And I imagine that after they had a few years in power, that's going to be real hard to maintain for them. So I'm always kind of watching out for that as well. Are the judges in the Sharia courts, have they generally been trained in Pakistan? No, they're not trained in Pakistan, but they are trained in um, Deobandi uh, um, madrasas, right? Um, and they're trained in, you know, the, the kind of... Uh, you know, Taliban's jurisprudence. So um, most Afghan, like most Talibs had, had a tendency to go back and forth into Pakistan. That was kind of a misunderstood kind of dynamic during the war. Um, but um, the, Abdul Sattar trained at, at, at a big famous madrasa outside of Kandahar. Um, most Taliban judges, and you know, most of these guys are kind of being pressed into service a little bit. You know, a lot of them were shot, kind of shadow judges during the war. But like the Mufti, for example, the kind of guy, the younger looking guy with the kind of they both had big beards, but the kind of heavier set guy, um, you know, he he wasn't a judge before the war. He's been he was a he was a, a mullah. He was a cleric and he's been kind of pressed into service because, you know, they didn't need so many shadow judges before because it was a, they, they can carry can cover so much territory. Now they're in charge of the whole country. So they're like, oh, we're short on judges. So they pressed a lot of these guys into service. Abdul Sattar had trained in, in Islamic jurisprudence. But the Mufti had not. And so they were and they were both kind of and so the Mufti was kind of learning on the job, so to speak. And is there a big resurgence of the Sharia school in Kabul that once was sort of large and, and famous? Is that a, is that part of the Taliban policy? You know, I, I don't really know that much. I mean, the Talibs have been very they, they have so much to deal with. They've been very slow to kind of, um, you know, it, you know, the thing they've concentrated on first more than anything is roads. I mean, they are building roads to beat the band. They're building roads all day, every day, improving the roads. It's kind of taken them a while to get to every kind of aspect of governance. And to be honest, I kind of figured they'd be a little better at it. You know, they had 20 years prepare, but um, I don't know about if that specific school has been kind of reinstated, I'm sure to some degree, but I'm sure it's gonna take years for it to kind of assume its place and 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 it'll take years for its graduates to kind of work their way into the system. Um, but I do know that they are, you know, like with the universities and stuff, they've been very, very slow. Even with the public schools, it was only this year that they finally, for the first time, you know, it took them an extra year. They said they were going to re release materials in early 22, like a revision of the public school curriculum for, for children. And it took them, actually, they had to put it off a year to even get that done. So I think it's been, it's been a slow process for them to kind of exert themselves in the education system. So have, have your experiences, uh, you know, intensely uh, following these Sharia courts, has it impacted your own sense of what justice means on the ground and in conflict zones in Afghanistan specifically, but maybe more generally? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. You know, I mean, well, the one thing it did was it really pointed out 
even more than the fall did, like the kind of blind spots I had in trying to understand Afghanistan, trying to understand the country, understand the dynamic there. Um, I mean, I think it's it's definitely, uh, I, I'm if I wasn't before, I'm a greater adherent to the kind of um, colloquialism, uh, you know, the perfect is the enemy of the good, right? That um, like the more justice you can deliver to the to most people, that's that's the most important thing rather than making sure that everything is is perfectly kind of perfectly sorted out. Um, and and watching these Talib judges churn through that many cases was, I mean, it, they were very earnest. You know, they really understand. I mean, of course, we were in a place Musakala where they're the the Taliban are the natural leaders rulers of Musakala, right? And we kind of grapple with this about where to shoot the film. Should we do it there? Should we do it in another area of the country where the Talibs aren't the kind of de, de facto kind of legitimate uh, kind of governing force? But um, so we were kind of in their heartland. But, you know, I think about places, I think about other countries I've visited. I think about Central America where corruption and, and you know, and, and double dealing is endemic to the justice system there. I mean, you know, the impunity that's ruled the Northern Triangle countries since the wars in El Salvador and Guatemala has dramatically undermined those countries. We're looking at El Salvador right now. You know, they just elected a dictator to the, you know, it's illegal for somebody to run for president twice in El Salvador. And they've elected a guy who claims to be the coolest dictator in the world. That's a direct result of a weak justice system, right, of, a, of a ongoing impunity. And and it's been interesting to see if the Taliban, and I'll be interested to see if the Taliban can kind of hang on to this if they can kind of keep going with this or if it's going to be a short-lived kind of flash in the pan and then if they fall into the same kind of traps that their that previous you know rulers of Afghanistan have fallen into and what do you think of somebody who was there documenting so many hours of these proceedings when you see uh the judges saying things like uh beat him the truth will come out or you know they have whips in their hands or, or somebody in the administrative functions got the whips in their hands you know What's the takeaway from that? Does that have itself a form of legitimacy? Is that something one should step back and see as a human rights violation? Um, what's what what guidance can you provide for us viewers? Well, you know, I will say that um, the Talib do have a, the Talibs have a penchant for corporal punishment. There's no question about it. And I've come in on the receiving end of that a couple of times. I've had a couple of good kind of beat ups in the street from Talibs who get over anxious. Um, that said, of course, Afghanistan is not like our society. The standards of the norms of kind of, of behavior, the norms of physical violence are completely different than our own. And I have to be careful. It's not my job to judge, you know, uh, whether or not these, these punishments, whether or not these behaviors are right or wrong. I, I, it's my job to try to understand them and trying to communicate them as clearly as I can to folks coming from a context like my own that is so dramatically different from theirs. So, you know, of course, you know, I'm like the worst was guys who, so if, if, if you're accused of a crime and they're going to let you go prove it, you have to like provide like a stand in for yourself in jail. And so like a few guys like would have to get their buddy or their brother to spend a few days in jail for them while they ran around and tried to prove their case. And, you know, the guys that got whooped on a little bit, you know, that's, that's unfortunate. That's tough. I, you know, you hate to see that, I, that contravenes my own values, but my own values don't, don't really matter in this situation. You know, they don't, it's it's not my job to 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 kind of look at it through the lens of my values. It's to look at it through the lens of my under, of, of my understanding. But these guys that got stuck in jail for a few days, I did really feel for those guys. Like you know, there's one guy got stuck in jail. And his brother ran off and never came back, and he was stuck in jail the whole time we were there. And man, I hated to see that. That was tough. That was a bummer. Um, and you know, of course, now you know the Talibs are very quietly introduced these more dramatic punishments: the hudud and kisas, the you know the eye for an eye punishments, the the kind of like um retaliation in kind um very very quietly the thing that the west doesn't quite always understand is those punishments come with like carry a huge like evidentiary hurdle right like there has to be like it, it, they're very rarely implemented because it's very rare that something happens that you that will pass those evidentiary kind of uh uh barriers you know um but they have quietly started to implement them they've done some public floggings you know of course like th those contravene my own values but if, we, if we're going to be honest about it, so much of Afghan society is in contravention of our own values. And our job is to kind of understand it on its terms and then try to understand how it's stumbling its way forward with, and, and how much and how much damage our own intervention, the West and other powers, you know, Pakistan, Russia's uh, 
interventions have how much damage that they've done to the society there you know uh, Victor, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and uh, have a very good evening.